been sworn have not voted in the affirmative and the motion is not agreed to. The Majority Leader. I have a motion to reconsider. My is not a vote in S 1845. The motion is entered. The motion is entered. Motion to reconsider. Motion is entered. The motion is entered. And prior to that, Madam President, I ask consent that I be allowed to offer motion to Senate will be in order. I ask consent that I be allowed to offer motion to reconsider the previous vote. It's oh, it's entered. Okay. Uh, I know everyone's in a hurry here to get out here, and I'll be very, very brief. Mr. Madam President, I want to make sure I'm very clear where we stand. We're one Republican vote away from restoring unemployment insurance for 1.7 million Americans, 20,000 veterans who have lost their benefits during the last uh, five weeks. We all support this on this side of the aisle. Right now, there's one Republican vote standing between 1.7 million Americans and the lifeline they need to make ends meet. I ask my Republican colleagues to think about the woman from Nevada, 57 years old. She's couch surfing. Now, younger people know a little bit about that term, but I hadn't heard the term before. She has, because she's been forced to understand what it is, going around to friends' homes, apartments, and uh, sleeping on their couch. 57 years old, worked from the time she's 18 years old. She's lost her job. She can't find a job. She's a long-term unemployed. If she just lost her job last week or a couple months ago, she could go get on unemployment. But she's out of work for too long to be able to get this. She's sold everything she has except a clunker of a car. All of her personal things, she did that so, Madam President, she could buy gas in case she gets an interview. People are just like this in every state. Our job is to do right by them. All we need is one more Republican vote to step up, do the right thing, cross out. We're going to bring this vote up again sometime. I've spoken to my colleague, Senator Heller, and said, Dean, let's get this done. Tell me what is needed to get this done. I now ask unanimous consent, Madam President, that I've consulted with the Republican leader, and now I ask consent to move exec to an executive session to consider account number 629, the nomination of our friend, Max Bacchus, the ambassador to China. Further, that with all other provisions in effect, I ask all time be yielded back with all other provisions on the previous order remaining in effect. Is there objection? Is there objection? Without objection. Without objection. Clerk will report. Nomination. Department of State. Max Stephen Baucus of Montana to be ambassador to the People's Republic of China. The question is on the nomination. Is there a sufficient second? There is sufficient second. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mm -hmm. Barrasso. Ms. Ayotte. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso.
Mr. Baucus. Mr. Beckage. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. King, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrieu, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, <laughs> Mr. Shelby, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, 
Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Ayotte, Baldwin, Barrasso, Bennett, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Boxer, Brown, Burr, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Chambliss, Coates, Cochran, Collins, Coons, Corker, Cornyn, Crapo, Donnelly, Enzi, Feinstein, Fisher, Flake, Franken, Gillibrand, Graham, Grassley, Hagen, Harkin, Hatch, Heinrich, Heitkamp, Heller, Hirono, Hoven, Inhoff, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson, Wisconsin, Johnson, South Dakota, Kane, King, Kirk, Klobuchar, Leahy, Lee, Levin, Manchin, Markey, McCain, McCaskill, McConnell, Menendez, Merkley, Mikulski, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Nelson, Paul, Portman, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Rockefeller, Rubio, Schatz, Scott, Shaheen, Shelby, Stabenow, Tester, Thune, Toomey, Udall, Colorado, Udall, New Mexico, Vitter, Warner, Whitehouse, and Wicker. Mr. Booker? Aye. Mr. Wyden? Aye. Mr. Wyden? Aye. No senator voted in the negative. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Pryor, aye. Ms. Warren, aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Beckage, aye. Mr. Risch, aye.
Mr. Sessions, aye. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Sanders, aye. Any senators wishing to vote or to change their votes? If not, the ayes are 96, the nays are zero, one announced present. The confirmation of Max Sieben Baucus of Montana to be ambassador to the People's Republic of China is confirmed. Previous order, the President will be immediately notified of the Senate's action and the Senate will resume legislative session. Madam President. Senator from Utah. Madam President, I'm really pleased that my colleague and very dear friend Max Baucus was confirmed by this body the way he was. He will make a fine ambassador to China. We all know what an honorable, decent man he is. We all know of his abilities. We all know that he's run a very, very tough committee, a very, very important committee, and has done a terrific job in doing so. All I can say is I rise today to wish my good friend Senator Max Baucus good luck as he departs to serve as the next U.S. ambassador to China. Now, we're going to miss Max. I don't think it's fair to this body, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I think it's fair to our country because uh, Max will make a great ambassador. Senator Baucus first came to the Senate in 1978 and has the distinction of being Montana's longest-serving U.S. Senator. So as you can see, 
I've served with Senator Baucus for a long time, longer than the two of us would like to admit sometimes. And over the years, I've come to respect his commitment both to his constituents and to his principles. And having worked side by side with him on the Senate Finance Committee, I know a lot about his constituents and his principles. He raised his constituents constantly, and his principles, I don't think he ever wavered. If you want to understand my friend Max Bucks's priorities, take a look at, at uh, the sign on his Senate office desk. Like Max, it is to the point and unequivocal. The sign says, quote, Montana comes first, unquote. Plain and simple, not much nuance. The language is uh, pretty decorative, de declarative, I should say. That's Max Baucus. In his long and distinguished Senate career, he always put the people of Montana first. Both Senator Baucus and I are Westerners, and the Westerners expect a certain amount of independence in their senators. They expect us to work across the aisle and attempt to solve problems and work together. Now, of course, we Republicans tend to view that problem solving as less government, and Democrats tend to view that problem solving as more government. That's not universal, but that's where the two sides usually come down. That being the case, Max and I have often found ourselves on different sides of some of these issues. However, we share the desire to solve problems and, as Max's sign says it, to put our constituents' interests first. Senator Baucus has always understood that notion very well, and I'm here to declare that to everybody who listens. As a result, his disposition, particularly as chairman of the Finance Committee, has been to try to find a way to a bipartisan yes rather than a partisan no. I've always respected him for that. And over the last few years, as I've served alongside Max as the ranking member of the Finance Committee, I've greatly appreciated his willingness to put partisan differences aside for the greater good of all. One objective you could describe Senator Baucus is uh, one used by his predecessor as chairman of the Finance Committee, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. The term I'm thinking is indefatigable. Whether it was preparing for and running a marathon, watching, walking across the wide expanse of his home state, or working at one of the many jobs he regularly undertook back home in recent visits, Max has been indefatigable. He's been a tireless legislator. Just ask his staff. They'll affirm that fact. As a senator, he was always working. I have no doubt that he'll do the same as our nation's ambassador to China, arguably the most important diplomatic post in the world today. As we saw today, the vote on his confirmation wasn't even close. That's because all of his colleagues know that Max Baucus is a committed public servant who will serve the American people with confidence, dignity, and a tireless commitment to our nation and its interests. I have to say that there, I feel personally about this uh, nominee and about this nomination. I like Max very much. Having served with him on the Senate Finance Committee, he has always tried to be fair. He's always tried to consider the other's point of view. He's always tried to consider different ways of solving problems, and he's worked to do so. That's about all we can ask from our colleagues uh, on the other side, uh, either Democrats or Republicans. I just want to at this time wish Senator Baucus and his lovely wife, Melody, uh, and of course his family, the best of luck in this and all future endeavors. As Max departs the Senate, Senator Baucus leaves behind a great legacy and really big shoes to fill. So at this particular point, I hesitate to say farewell to my friend Max Baucus, but I only say farewell knowing that he's going to go on to a very, very important job for our country, where I think he'll do a very, very good job. And you'll have my support as he serves over there, and let's just hope that we on the Finance Committee can uh, do a better job, and, or at least an equivalent job, to what Max has done uh, to keep these very, very important issues on the most important committee in the Congress moving along. I have nothing but respect for Max. I appreciate him very much. I'm his friend, and I intend to continue, I intend to continue this friendship as long as we both live. So with that, I just want to congratulate you, Senator Baucus. I'm proud of you, and I intend to support you while you're there as well. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Delaware.
Madam, uh, Madam President, uh, the Chinese uh, New Year began, as you probably know, just a, a couple of days ago. And uh, I don't know a lot of words in, uh, in Chinese, but uh, among the words that I have learned is uh, how to say uh, Happy New Year. And uh, this is the uh, it's a new year in, uh, in China. It's a new year for Chinese Americans here in, in this country as, as well. And I think it's uh, the way we say Happy New Year is Gong Shi Fai Sai. And uh, so I say that uh, to you, my friend. The, uh, when uh, the word came out, uh, Madam uh, President, uh, that he was, uh, had been nominated by the president for this uh, role, uh, I'd say to our, our, friend from, uh, our friend from Utah, I ran into Max, and he was about to go into an elevator, I think in the Hart Building, and I said, uh, I know the president's nominated you for this, but you can't leave. Uh, we, we need your leadership on tax reform. We need your leadership on uh, SGR uh, fix and doc fix and all these other issues, trade policy. You can't leave now. And, uh, and he said, well, the president's nominated me. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to put a hold on your nomination. <laughs> and he was about to get in the elevator and go away, and he put his head back out and said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> well, I was tempted to. I was tempted to because there's a lot uh, you leave uh, uh, at a time. Actually, I think you leave at a time when this place is working better. And I'm encouraged by it. I'm, frankly, I'm encouraged by the relationship that the, you have uh, kindled with uh, uh, Senator Hatch. I'm encouraged by the relationship that you've uh, kindled with um, our friend Dave Camp uh, from, uh, from Michigan over in the House as Chairman of the Ways and, and Meads Committee. And really have set an example for, for the rest of us. It's as ironic the, uh, the ranking, uh, the chair of the committee and the ranking members sitting here across the aisle from, uh, from each other. But uh, the two of them, in terms of, uh, of providing uh, personal examples, the kind of leadership that we do as I do, not as I say, because both of you are terrific at reaching across the aisle. Doing what the people sent us here to do, find principal compromises, get things done. And I, I want to mention, uh, uh, let me just ask, and you could just uh, maybe nod his head, but uh, my recollection is when, when we took up the issue of whether or not there should be a Medicare prescription drug program, that uh, was supported by, uh, initially by Senator Kennedy and by President George W. Bush. I think in, in the end, the, uh, the, the, the version of that to prevail was the, the, the version I think preferred by President uh, Bush. And my recollection is that uh, uh, Senator Baucus may have gone across the aisle and supported that, uh, that version of, of the bill, took uh, me and probably another 10 or so Democrats uh, with him. Not an easy thing to do. I, I remember going back to to Delaware, I've told them this story before, I went back to Delaware and just held a number of uh, town hall meetings, if you will, on that issue, and uh, just got ex excruciated, was eviscerated by mostly Democrats. They would come and say, how could you do this? How could you support that prescription drug program, the Medicare Part D program? And I explained, I thought it was a principal compromise, I thought it would work. A year later, it's got 85% approval rating by the people who use it. For six or seven straight years, it's been, it still has an 85% approval rating, a little higher than ours. But uh, the, uh, and if you, if you look at the, the uh, it's uh, how we're doing in terms of anticipated costs, seven years under budget, I think seven consecutive years under budget. When uh, the time came to try to find a, uh, a compromise on comprehensive health care reform, I remember you didn't just work with three of our Republican colleagues on the Finance Committee, uh, and Senator Grassley, uh, Senator Snow, Senator Enzo, you didn't just work with them for a couple of days to try to find a principal compromise. We worked with him for weeks, I think months, to try to do that. And ultimately we were unsuccessful, but then led us through a difficult, difficult markup in committee and here on the floor. And uh, while I know there are reservations and I know there are things in, in that, that law that we should tweak and, and change and make it better, but I think uh, in the end, uh, your leadership will be vindicated. And a lot of Americans, uh, just like we do with the Medicare prescription drug program, are going to say that was the right thing to do and thank you for, for, for the leadership that, uh, that you've provided. I, uh, I, on a personal level, as I would say, as Senator, uh, Senator Hatch has, uh, has said, this is a, a personal loss to, to me, and I know to many Democrats and, and Republicans, but uh, you leave a, behind a, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful legacy. And uh, behind me, seated behind me, you leave behind a whole lot of people, and uh, they've all brought their resumes. No, no, not really. <laughs> One or two of them may have. But you have a reputation to surround yourself by it with really good people. I've sought to do that, kind of learn from you and, and Senator Hatch, but uh, I've always sought to surround myself by people smarter than me. My wife always says, it's not hard to find them. 
And uh, you've uh, done a great job surrounding yourself by terrific people. They're here today sitting behind us over in, in, uh, on the Republican side with uh, sitting in the staff up in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gallery. A lot, of, uh, a lot of love here, and I hope you, you feel it from all of us. And uh, in the Navy, when, uh, when people uh, uh, will pull up their anchor and prepare to sail off into the, uh, the sunset or the sunrise, uh, whatever the case may be, we always uh, like to say uh, fair winds and a following sea. Fair winds and a following sea. And that's what I, I wish to you and to Mel. We're going to, uh, to miss you here, and, uh, but we're really going to miss her. <laughs> And we hope we'll have an opportunity to see you again and to work with you again. And uh, we hope the same is that we'll have an opportunity to see, to see Mel. We think the world of, of, of her. So good luck to both of you. May God bless you. Madam President. Senator from Illinois. Madam President, I just want to make a brief statement um, before uh, Senator Buck speaks. And Thank him for his service in the Senate. Thank him for representing Montana and accepting some of the toughest assignments in the United States Senate. We have a similarity in our background. We were both inspired to this position by senators who served before us. In your case, uh, Senator Mansfield, who was an extraordinary leader in the United States Senate and an extraordinary man when you consider his contribution uh, to our country serving in two world wars, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps in three different branches of the military. And it was just an exceptional life of public service, which ended with his ambassadorship to Japan, if I'm not mistaken. And now Senator Baucus, who has, was inspired to public life by Senator Mansfield, followed in his footsteps in representing a senior senator of the state of Montana, serving in one of the highest leadership spots in the United States Senate, and now off to an ambassadorship, which when you consider the uh, ebb and flow of history, is singularly the most important ambassadorial assignment which the United States of America can, can make. And today, this overwhelming bipartisan vote of the United States Senate is a fitting tribute to Senator Max Baucus for his service, his friendship, and his continued dedication to be a servant of our nation. I wish you and Mel the very best in this new assignment. We hope to get a chance to come see you and also more importantly, to work with you to make sure that our relationship with China remains strong for many decades to come. Thank you, Max, for being such a great colleague and great friend. I yield the floor. President. Senator from Montana. Let me begin by uh, thanking so many of my friends here, the Durbin, the Carper, the Hatch, and, and so many others. Um, I must say to you, you, you what your remarks mean a lot to me, but it probably mean more to you, more to me than I think you know. It means so much to me, and thank you for what you've said. I'd also like to begin by thanking the people of Montana. Uh, the people of Montana are giving me, have given me the honor of representing them in the United States Congress for it's nearly 40 years. It's 39 now, and at the end of, actually, end of this year, it'll be 40 years. I want to thank President Obama very much for the opportunity to serve American people as ambassador to China. I also want to recognize one of the best teammates and friends anyone could ever ask for, Senator John Tester. Thank you, John. There is nothing greater in life than the love of family. I have been an incredibly lucky man. I'd like to thank my wife, Mel, my son, Zeno, his wife, Stephanie. I'd also like to thank our children, Katie and Joey. Mel, Zeno, Stephanie, Katie, and Joey, you inspire me daily. I'm so grateful for each of you. I am so blessed to have Mel in my life. Her energy, her zest for life, her positive outlook, and her love have transformed me. I'm the luckiest guy in the world because of Mel. 
Katie and Joey are clearly inspired by their mother. They are great kids, great achievers. I think the last grades I saw, ones in law school, the others in college, they got all A's. Why? Because they're inspired by their mother. That's why they just do so well in the best sense of their term. My son, Zeno, is one of the best kids parents could ever wish for. I'm so proud of him. He's so smart, intelligent, decent. He is currently assistant U.S. attorney living in Helena with his wife, Stephanie. I'm proud of him. You may have read about that case where a lady pushed her husband off a cliff in Glacier Park, Montana. Well, he's the prosecutor in that case. Very proud of him. And just an indication, that, again, how proud I am of him. I learned more about that case reading the papers than I did from him. He keeps his cards close to his vest. He's such a decent, smart, effective guy. Stephanie, his wife, has jumped right into life in Montana. She is so talented and special, and the Helena community is very lucky to have her. Thanks so much, my parents, Jean and John Bacchus, and I wish they were here today. Growing up on a ranch in Montana, you learn the simple lessons in the measure of life. You learn to cherish the land. It gets in your blood. You work hard. It's humbling. So much you cannot control working on a ranch. You can't control the weather. It's either going to rain or not rain. You can't control the prices. It gives you a little perspective, philosophical about life. On the ranch, you are charged also with nurturing life, um, nurturing livestock, protecting a small part of nature's bounty. It's one of the obligations you learn as a rancher. It's also the Montana way to love the outdoors. We are outdoors people in Montana. We hunt, we fish, we backpack, we hike, we grow crops, raise livestock, um, mine coal, cut timber, in the recreation industry. We're outdoor people. I think Montans are more outdoor people than any other people in the country. And we love it. It's, it's, it becomes part of our soul. As Montana writer Bud Guthrie said, quote, I am part of it, a mor mortal partner to eternity. I grew up this way, and it shored up my belief that we all have a moral obligation to our kids and our grandkids when we leave this place to leave as good a shape or better shape than we found it. That internal compass was also a lasting gift for my parents and their love of the land. My mom was one of the most special persons one could have the privilege to know. She had the class of Grace Kelly and the spunk and grit of Catherine Hepburn. She had a combination of them both. Intelligent, classy lady, always positive, always upbeat, always nurturing, so intelligent and so well read. She even read more books than I did. I come home at night, hey, Mom, what are you reading? She tell me all about the book. Once she's reading President Obama's second book that he wrote when he's a senator, what do you think about that, Mom? Oh, it's a pretty good book. It's got something to say. It's a little long though. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, she wrote a note to the president, told him what she liked it, and uh, he wrote back, and it was. They became pen pals. It's, it's very, very nice. Someone asked me last week what my mother would have thought of all this. She would have been incredibly excited and fascinated with the adventure ahead. And while I miss her every day, in fact, I talk to her every day at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. That hour goes by daily, and I keep thinking of her. She's always on my mind. As is my father. He loaded bombs on airplanes in, in Europe during World War II a product of the Great Depression, instilled in me the values of hard work and humility and good faith. Um, he worked me hard on the ranch, stacked a lot of hay, a lot of fencing. I know why he did it, for the right reasons. I didn't complain, but I knew that he was trying to raise me in a way that he hoped would uh, help me later in life. He was also such a decent person. No one ever spoke an ill word of my father, ever. Such rock-solid character. The Republican Party in Montana, Madam President, even asked him to run for governor. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. He didn't care about that politics stuff. He's a rancher and just liked what he's doing, ranching. I'm so blessed to have such great parents. Fifty-two years ago, I was full of youthful idealism and curiosity about life beyond the ranch. And I'm sure it had something to do, caused somewhat by my parents. As a college student at Stanford, I decided to take a year off from my studies to my junior and senior year. I grabbed a knapsack, 
and it hitchhiked around the world one year. It was June, basically, when was it? August 62 to August September 63. I set out to visit countries I had only imagined. India, Japan, and China, to name a few. And before I departed, I had never thought about a life of public service. But that trip opened my eyes. It charted my course. I realized how people across the globe were interconnected. We're all in this together. I saw the indispensable role that America plays as a leader on the world stage. It was so obvious. And right where I was, in the middle of then Belgian Congo, and I had an epiphany. All this, this realization hit me. We're so connected. Our natural resources are diminishing. And somehow we've got to work better together if we're going to have better lives for not only ourselves, but for everyone on the globe. We are so connected. The world is getting smaller, and our natural resources, in fact, are diminishing. We have to find a way to work better together. I returned home with a commitment to a career where I could improve the lives of my fellow Montanans and all Americans. Madam President, I would not be standing here today had it not been for that trip where I hitchhiked around the world. Probably the most defining year of my life. It was by far the most influential, and that one year set into motion a series of opportunities to serve that I would never have dreamed of, and I never dreamed at the time it would take me back to China to represent the United States 50 years later. When I first ran for statewide office in 1973, no one knew me from Adam. I've been away from the state for many years. I needed some advice. I had met Mike Mansfield when I was in high school. Instantly, there was a man that I totally respected, honored, and he planted the seed, I know, for later interest in public service. I didn't really, it wasn't a defining moment, but I could tell at the time. He told me I should run. I should go back home to serve. I was then working at the SEC, just a short distance from here. And if I wanted to run for Congress, he said, it would take a lot of hard work and a lot of shoe leather and a little bit of luck. Exact words. Well, I took his advice literally. I wore out as much shoe leather as I knew how. I walked the entire state length of the state of Montana, from Gardner in the south, Gardner's next to Yellowstone Park, up to the Yak, a remote part of Montana, up the edge of Montana near the Canadian border. I got to know so many great people who later put me to work for them in the U.S. House. It was right in the middle of the Watergate political scandal. I joined a congressional class determined to restore good faith and trust in government. A terrific bunch of folks. They were just great, the Watergate class. Think of my friends Chris Dodd, Tom Harkin, Paul Simon, Henry Waxman, George Miller, just to name a few. A great class were in running for office and serving for the right reasons. When I hitchhiked around the globe as a young man, I also realized that no country has a monopoly on religion, culture, or virtue. We're all together. We're all people. We're all in this together. And all people basically have the same dreams for their families. Put food on the table, make ends meet, take care of their kids, health care they can afford, and a clean environment for their families to explore and enjoy. The United States Senate can make people's dreams a reality. We're so lucky as Americans to have this institution under our Constitution, written by very perceptive forefathers. It offers what few institutions in the world can boast, the opportunity to make a difference when history calls. One of the greatest privileges I've had in this job is having one of the best staffs on the Hill. They're sitting behind me, some of them. They're just terrific. They've always been ready with big ideas and dedication to answer history's call. If there, if there is a vanguard of vision, my staff has been in it. I might say parenthetically, I'm very proud of my staff for another reason. Um, my office has spawned about six marriages. A, a woman or a man working in my office, didn't know each other until they started working in my office, got together and got married six times. And they've all worked, but for one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't know, maybe I worked them too hard or not hard enough. <laughs> but whatever the reason, they're just, I, 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 over the years, after they've married and see their kids, and it's just, it's just terrific. It's meant so much to me. How many people do you think have served in our office since the time I've been here? Well, the answer is 1,423. 
1,423 folks have worked on behalf of Montanans and half Americans, each person making a positive difference in the lives of others, and I thank them all so very much. In the years I've been here, the United States Senate voted to send our sons and daughters to fight wars overseas, protect our national security. I think the strongest human instinct is self-preservation. When you come from a beautiful place like Montana and the wonderful people of our state, state you'll stop at nothing to defend it. Montana has a proud tradition of answering the call to serve. In fact, more Montanans have volunteered for service per capita than nearly any other state in the nation. My own nephew, Philip, left college to enlist in the Marines, and before long, he is far away in Anbar province serving our country. I loved Philip like a son. His fellow Marines looked to him for support, for counsel, advice, leadership as they faced many firefights. He made Lance Corporal in record time. He gave his life to our nation. And then returned to the family ranch for the very last time. Philip, like each one of the fallen heroes who bore our battles, left behind big dreams undone and countless broken hearts. Dust to dust, we still shudder. President Lincoln concluded his second inaugural address with a call for the nation to care for him who shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan. Lincoln's commitment remains our sacred duty today. Here in the Senate, we have made a lot of progress. We enacted tax credits for businesses that hire veterans, a new GI Bill. The past 10 years, Congress has doubled support for the VA, an investment we should be proud of. Someone once wrote, in war, there are no unwounded soldiers. It's important we remember that. We make the tough votes to authorize war. We must also find the courage to band together so that our troops return to a nation that honors their service. Of all the bills I've worked on, there are two that stand out. In 2010, we wrote the Montana National Guard's model of improved PTSD screening and expanded it nationwide. That concept of very meaningful PTSD screening began in Montana with the Montana National Guard. It worked so well, I got it into a defense bill, and it's now being enacted nationwide. Make sure that we do our very best to protect the kids that are coming home. The new screenings have resulted in more than 800,000 service members who have received personal and private one-on-one -on -one attention from a trained health care provider both before and after deployment. Make no mistake, these screenings are saving lives. I'm also proud of another life-saving bill, the Affordable Care Act. It's been almost four years since President Obama signed that act, tied it into law, and in that time, the law has done more than any other in the past half century to expand access to health coverage. It has provided 71 million Americans free preventive services. More than 6 million seniors have achieved, received discounts on vital prescription drugs. More than 3 million young people have peace of mind knowing they're allowed to stay on their parents' health plans. I'm especially proud that now, no child no child can ever be denied health care coverage because they've been sick or had a pre-existing condition. It's been a tough road, but it's been a challenge I'm proud to have taken on. While the debate over the law continues, I'm proud to stand up for it because it is helping millions of Americans. Take Julie from Helena. Julie wrote me that she is self-employed and finally able to get access to affordable quality health care coverage because of the ACA. And take John from Missoula, whose daughter survived ovarian cancer. Thanks to the ACA, she was able to stay on her parents' insurance and win her battle against cancer. I'm very proud of the role I've played in helping make health care more accessible, more affordable to many more Americans. In this chamber, there are brilliant men and women. But with great respect for my colleagues, I insist that in the most important respect, senators are just ordinary people. Big, not so big, tall, short, men, women, we're just people. It's only through the extraordinary institution of the Senate that we ordinary people have the power to make life better for all Americans. We belong to and depend on something bigger than ourselves. When I first came to the United States Senate, senators from opposing parties actually had lunch together in the private Senate dining room, just down below here from here. It was called the Inner Sanctum. In those daily rituals, we learned about each other's families, home states, and developed real friendships. Senators dined together. No staff, no spouses, 
just senators, both sides of the aisle. Compare notes, talk about our kids, talk about family, talk about legislation, get to know each other. It's wonderful. Build trust, build confidence, understanding. It was a backbone of respect that we all relied upon. Those friendships provided a refuge from the political firestorms and common ground to return to after wrangling over disagreements of the day. Now, schedules are packed with caucus meetings and political fundraisers. The Senate is losing the spirit of friendship and forgiveness. In the words of Protestant theologian Ronald Niebuhr said, and I'm quoting him, is a final friendship and forgiveness, and I quote, is a final oil of harmony in all human relations, which rests upon the contrite recognition that our actions and attitudes are inevitably interpreted in a different light by our friends as well as our foes than we interpret them. Friendship and forgiveness. That's the oil of human relations. Brings us together. That private Senate dining room now carries just the echoes of the friendships once forged at its tables, and we are poor for it. Yet there's nothing inevitable about this trend. The hope of this body lies in the hearts of individual senators. The heart set upon solutions to problems that win over the heart devising traps for political gain. It's my honor to have friendships that form the basis for solving some of the nation's most difficult problems. I'll never forget working together with the late Senator John Chafee in the Environment and Public Works Committee. I worked with John for years before finding out he was an amazing war hero, decorated for his service in Korea. He didn't tell us that. It took years before I learned what a hero he was. Self-facing kind of a guy. Few people knew about this war record because he didn't brag about it or use it for political gain. He served because he believed in it, not because he thought he'd get credit for it. Without a doubt, we need more John Chafees in the world. Between 1989 and 1990, we sat together in a small room just off the Senate floor, facing wave after wave of unhappy senators until 1 or 2 in the morning. He was the ranking Republican of the EPW committee. I'd become chairman of that committee, at least of the subcommittee. Together, we met with our colleagues, ironing out compromises on acid rain, ozone depletion, air quality permits, and scores of other issues. Senator Chafee later became chairman of the full committee. We had our disagreements, but by and large, under Senator Chafee's chairmanship, I recall an oasis of civility. That friendship has helped us pass the Clean Air Act, the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. I'm very proud of that effort. And I was chairman of the committee at that time, finally passed. It's a small point, but I always respected that he never raised his voice. Always civil, always decent, always positive, upbeat, trying to find a solution here. John never lost his temper. He listened carefully to the other person's point of view. He was a paragon of the United States Senator. As is my good friend from Iowa, another, Chuck Grassley. Chuck and I began our friendship by deciding to meet weekly, face to face, his office, my office. Turned out to be 5.30 every Tuesdays. We'd bring our staffs together. Pretty soon our staff started talking to each other. Healthcare staffs after a while started talking to each other. Then our trade staff started talking to each other. Tax staff started talking to each other. Heck, we were basically one office. If you're a fly on the wall, you think that this is one office, people trying to get together to solve problems. You know, Chuck's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. We have differences, but our goal is to solve problems. We find solutions, Remember, uh, uh, adhering to our principles. Our friendship led to a culture of respect and honesty on the Senate Finance Committee that helped us pass important agreements and other bills to expand trading opportunities with the rest of the world. I'm especially proud of our work together to successfully shepherd through the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003. Senator Carper referred to it just a short while ago. I'd also like to thank my good friend, Dave Camp. Dave is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. We've worked together a lot over the last couple of years on tax reform. We've bridged the partisan divide to help pass the most recent highway bill and the payroll tax cut. Dave's a super, super American, a wonderful man. Mich Michiganders are very lucky to have him. Also a terrific honor working with my good friend, Senator Orrin Hatch. Orrin, and Dave, and I just recently worked together to introduce trade promotion authority legislation to make Congress a full partner in trade negotiations. In trade, as in so many areas, 
Working together is the only way to get the job done. Madam President, this is a real American over here, Orrin Hatch. He, he is a solid, solid Utah, cares about the state and this country, just a wonderful person to work with. I can't thank him enough. Thank you, Sir Hatch. In 1961, President-elect John Kennedy said, and I'm quoting, our governments at every branch, at every level, national, state, and local, must be as a city upon a hill, constructed and inhabited by men aware of their great trust and their great responsibilities. If we are indeed a city on the hill, it rests firmly on the bridges that senators build when they face even the deepest of divides. I mention my closest friendships across the aisle because it is those bridges that we lack the most today. The epiphany I had as a young man hitchhiking around the world 52 years ago, I believe, is even more relevant today. Advances in technologies and communications have made us more interconnected as ever, ever before. The challenges of globalization bind us together even more. Climate change, we're all in this together. Terrorism, economic development, education, can only be addressed with good faith and a commitment to finding common ground. I am committed in my next chapter to meet these challenges. The United States-China relationship, I believe, is one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world. It will shape global affairs for generations. We must get it right. Thirty years ago, Mike Mansfield said farewell to this institution by simply declaring, quote, there's a time to stay and a time to go. Now, as I face my own crossroads, I'm humbled to have the opportunity to follow in his footsteps. As America's ambassador to Japan, Mansfield worked hard to strengthen and improve America's relationship throughout Asia. I'll try to do the same. Many of you know I love to run. I've actually got my eye on the Beijing Marathon. But to be more honest, maybe get skilled down to the half marathon, <laughs> something a little shorter. As I think about my next endeavor, I'm reminded of something a professional runner, Paul Turgut, once said, that is, quote, ask yourself, can I give more? And the answer is usually yes, end quote. I can give more. We all can. And I thank President Obama for asking me. I am indeed energized to serve America in this new role and to look at this as my sprint to the finish. I trust Montanans to choose wisely as they have so well with my friend, the great senator from Montana, John Tester. My final message is not for my esteemed peers, but for the young people chasing their dreams across the Montana High Line, searching for meaning in the Yellowstone River Valley or climbing toward their future along the Rocky Mountain front. The headlines paint the picture that there is no honor in public service. I disagree. I think the greatest noble human endeavor is service. Service to friends, to family, to church, to synagogue, public service. The most noble human endeavor is service. So I urge you young folks to take up that challenge that politics is not an honorable profession. It's more than honorable. It's an obligation to serve. I urge you to follow and serve. Choose to serve others. For me, it has been the honor of a lifetime. I'm so lucky. Be ready because history is calling. It's with deep gratitude and respect that I say for the last time, with full faith in the highest forms in the Senate, I yield the floor, but we're doing so, I just have to say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just taking a trip, maybe for a year or two, across the Pacific. It's a trip. I'll be coming back because we all are together in different journeys that we take. And thank all of you, my colleagues. I yield the floor. <clears throat> Madam President. Senator from Oregon. Before he leaves the floor, just wanted to make a few comments about Senator Baucus. Our part of the world has 